Unlocked is brought to you by Invincible, a program designed to unlock the potential of people and teams inside your organization. Join companies like Pfizer, Delta, the CDC, Google, and Chick-fil-A and others in over 116 countries that are currently using this program to increase productivity and develop healthy cultures. Access hundreds of hours of content that is accessible anytime, anywhere. And finally, use real-time data to understand the health of every team inside your organization, which teams are performing and which ones aren't. Then understand the why behind that performance. Get free access to Invincible for 30 days by visiting www.giant.tv slash 30 days. Hello, welcome to another episode of Unlocked. I am Scott. Today, we are talking about unlocking the potential of your organization and your people through change. Because what's the only thing guaranteed in life? That things are going to change. And we have a very smart individual on the call today that is going to talk to us about change. His organization, ProSci, is one of the leading companies that understands researches and builds teams around this idea of change, change management firm. And Tim Creasy, not Greasy, that was his name in elementary school. And I don't know if we talked about that in the interview when it was recording, but that's what he said. So I'm going to say it here. And that is how you pronounce his name, Tim Creasy. And he talks about all types of thing with, things within this change management space. He's been doing this for two decades. He has spoken globally to thousands of people about the idea of change. Um, they've, ProSci handles some of the world's largest research when it comes to the idea of change management. And he understands the roles and the things about change. He comes from an economic background, which helps give him the data rich analytic perspective. And the dude has a sense of humor. So you got to pay attention to that because it's in there. It's in there. We even take a little break in the middle to talk about Marvel, which, you know, doesn't suck because if you're a Marvel fan, you know, it's pretty awesome. So let's get on with the interview. We talk about some really beautiful things at the end where he gives you an acronym. Um, called, I want to make sure I get it right, ADKAR, A-D-K-A-R. And is that right? A-D-K? Yes, it is. That's right. A-D-K-A-R. And that acronym, he explains at the end, is the formula for effective change within your organization. So without further ado, let's get on with this, Tim. Tim, awesome having you on the show, man. Yeah, very excited to be here. Thanks for having me. Okay, so I'm going to go ahead and put it out there. Okay. You are the change management guru. Oh, come on now. Don't go there. No, I did. I went there. I, went I don't know. I don't, I don't like it at all. You know, I, uh, I've been thinking about kind of my role leading innovation, mm -hmm. uh, you know, research development at ProSci, and I absolutely have decided it's much more that of a discoverer than an inventor. I love that. And so, so yeah, yeah. I, you know, I'll, I'll say you're a guru when it comes to me. Okay. Okay, okay. Let's put it out there like that. Can we do that? All right. Um, I'll give because you that. you're, you're a guru to somebody and, and I'll put it out there and I'm going to use this as a way to educate myself about this whole change management space. I love that space, but you have been in it for two decades. Like, yeah. Tell us what it is. Like blow us up. Yeah. And, and I love when we start with what is it? Because I joke that I've been at ProSci over 20 years now and I've been with my partner the whole time and she can almost describe what it is I do for a job. Uh, and no knock on her, right? Because she's twice as smart as me, guaranteed. Um, but if you're not in the space, it's hard to wrap your head around what this discipline of change management is. And so I started taking this approach. Go to get a rental car. This was back when I traveled. Remember, do you remember traveling? <laughs> Conferences and dinners and all that stuff we used to do. Uh, go to the rental car counter. Are you here for business or pleasure? I'd say business. And they'd say, what do you do for a job? And I'd say, oh, do you have like an hour and a half? Because sometimes it feels like that's how long it takes to explain what change management is. Uh, and they don't think that's a funny joke. He, apparently, you didn't find like, it that funny do, either. Do what? No, what? they're like, what? What? Uh... Do you want an upgrade? I just need to get you off you, this do counter. Do you want to purchase 
the like, gas now or later and my wife's like they're gonna put you in the lemon if you keep messing with them like that so i started doing this remember the last time they updated your uh you know registration system and i pointed at the computer screen and they go oh my god it was the worst three months of our life. They never told us what was going on. They didn't include us. Then they dropped the change on our heads and expected us to just be able to pick it up and run with it. And then they got mad at us when it didn't work like it. we needed it to work. I said, that's what we do is we help them not do that to you. Um, I got a real good friend. He was a principal of an elementary school. Tim, I don't know what you do. I said, do you remember last year when you rolled out that new set of standards? He's like, oh, God teachers in my office at six in the morning, parents in my office till nine at night. I'm like, yep. We help them think through how they did that so that that's not how everybody had to feel. Because in times of change, there's always, always a technical side of the change. That's the solution, the nuts and bolts of it, and the people side of the change. How do we help our people actually engage, adopt, and use the change? And so that's what we do at ProSci. That's what change management is all about. How do we bring structure and intent to helping our people succeed through the changes we're asking them to make. Because if they're more successful at the new change we ask them to make, well, first of all, they're more successful. The project is more likely to deliver results on time, on budget, be less risky, and we've got loads of data there. But ultimately, the organization's better off because it's building the muscle to outchange whatever comes at it, which is probably the most important muscle any organization can grow right now. So hold on, but hold on, hold on, hold on. So say that again. Build the muscle to out, to out change. change. Like, yeah. I love that. And that muscle is the people. The muscle to out change exists all over throughout the organization, certainly. But people growing their own change capability is one of the most important enablers of kind of that organizational agility, that out changing muscle. And it exists everywhere, right? Um, we do a lot of work in the public sector. And so immediately when you think of out change, you think of out changing the competition, right? My background's in economics, so we can digress here for a little bit, right? That uh, many of the sources of competitive advantage have eroded based on how fast things are changing right now, right? You used to roll out a new service back in the past, and it would be a year before your competitors caught up with you. Now they can mimic it in the next, you know, two or three weeks. Things are moving that quickly. So if things are moving that fast, the way we win is by being able to outchange how quickly the other guy is outchanging. And if it's a competitive space, we're on a shelf, you know, we're outchanging the competition, but all of us are outchanging. You know some of the things we're all outchanging? Uh, technological revolution. You know, they got talked about as a digital transformation, but it was really just a technological revolution up until March 2020. And then it became a true digital transformation, an involuntary digital transformation, but actually that transformed the fabric of who we are in the, as organizations. So that's one of the things we're trying to outchange is the digital transformation, a global pandemic. The entire world, right? Uh, the most collective and individual change we've ever experienced happens across the planet. All of us are working to outchange the continuing shifting conditions and what that creates for us. Um, societal shifts we're working to outchange, new expectations of our customers or new demands of our constituents if we happen to be in the public sector. Um, we were, I mean, I put together a return to the workplace advisory board early in the pandemic and they were talking about which employees do you bring back first? And somebody in the board said, uh, the customer facing employees first, right? And somebody else around the board says, do your customers even wanna come interact with you face to face anymore? And they said, oh, no, no, no. Like they are so past that kind of interaction with us, they figured out it's way more effective to go this way. So shifting customer constituent demands, these are all of the tailwinds that we're working to out change as organizations. And so change management's a discipline that says, how do we be smarter about helping our people through a change so that we achieve the outcomes of that change? And that's one of those most part of growing agility is really is a strategic imperative, right? So the, the people side that you're hitting on is what you focus on yeah. and your world. Um, so you, I, mean, I have something to share with you. You pick the hard part of that, you know, you should just pick the other side because the other side is the easier part, right? So you pick the hard part, the people part, because, you know, if, if, if people weren't involved, everything would just be a lot easier, right? Yes. If we just didn't involve the people, it'd be so much easier. So why, but why is that people part so hard? 
Yeah, so I think a couple of thoughts here. First of all, this conversation in 2021 is very different than it would have been in 2017 or 2009. You know, in 2001, when I joined ProSci, the people side of change was very much like the crazies in the corner, right? I think overall, there's really been an acceptance of how important the people side of organizational change is. And I actually had started building out a podcast in 2016 uh, with one of my best friends, his name is Patrick McCreesh, called The Rehumanization of the Workplace. Really identifying a lot of the trends that we were spotting, not one of these like rah, rah, change the workplace, but there is a trend emerging and a lot of the things that we were watching happen in organizations that all indicated this revaluing of the human being that makes up the organization. Uh, did I mention my backgrounds in economics? We can digress here into like economic history and how we devalue and then revalue the human being and why an interaction economy and a knowledge and a service economy needs that revaluing of the people. But yeah, in the change management space, we hear about the soft side of change and it makes our, you know, the hair stand up on the back of our neck because sure enough, if we're integrating two big organizations, there's technical complexity in integrating the financial systems. That's, it's technically complex. The hard side of the change is getting people to step in and work as part of this unified organization. So why is it becoming a big deal right now? I think there is this, you know, shifting of the economics, moving from an agricultural to an industrial, to a service, to a knowledge, to an interaction economy. That's part of the reason the people side of change is getting more important. Um, shifting value systems is a big one too, Scott, right? Uh, this notion in the old value system of predictability, consistency, accountability, that was the old value system, right? And so when an employee was asked to jump, what was their answer? How far? How, how high, high, right? High. Absolutely. Yeah. That's, it's what we trained and incented and rewarded and said, those are the behaviors that we want to see in the organization. As we move towards empowerment, accountability, and ownership, I tell you, Scott, you own your job. You own all the parts of your job. I want you so invested. And now I need you to make a change. Your very first question is why? Why do you want me to make this change? You told me I owned this part of the business. So I think those new value systems make the people side of change more important. And then truly just the iterative and adaptive nature of change today, especially in this post-pandemic world. Uh, I think that's one of the biggest pills I'm watching organizations swallow right now is that we are no longer in pan pandemic response. The organizations that thought, oh, we'll just get through this. We'll just get through this. We're, we're way past just getting through this. It's time to step into reimagining what's in front of us. Uh, and that means the people side of change of the organization is going to be even more important. So, Oh, that's brilliant. To, to hit, hit on those three things again for us. So, Empowerment, ownership, and what? Empowerment, ownership, and accountability. Okay. And versus? They're replacing predictability, control, uh, authority, okay. right? Yeah. Yeah, authority. Yeah. Um, and and you've got that right. And there was, a, I was doing a recent workshop for a group of executives talking about, um, you know, secession planning and, you know, this is the first time in history that we know of that there's five generations in the workforce, like actually working. My dad is 82 and still works, right? right. He shouldn't, but we won't go into that. He's, he's still working, right? And we've got this massive ideology happening where we have, you know, older generations, baby boomers coming from a society and a culture of not having things like depression, um, just having the job for the industrial mindset, clock in, clock out. I'm grateful for the job I have. You respect authority and the people that give you your job and you're grateful for that versus this new mentality of, um, of the pandemic's going to shape this new generation, right? It's going to shape this mentality of who values me and who I am over profit, right? Who values people over profit, but where's that line and how do I make my name for myself and grow and invest in somebody? So I love that, that whole discussion. Yeah. I think, I think there's a couple of interesting wrinkles here. I think the notion, um, I think the notion that our 
the generation entering the workplace right now has this immense sense of purpose that hasn't been around in other generations. I, I'm not quite sure I buy into that. I think sometimes we start to misalign and misattribute uh, um, behaviors into some of those generations. But I do think you're spot on that we are stepping into leading change across an organization made up of a whole bunch of different generations that carry with them different you know, sets of values. I tend to like to focus more on the relationship between the organization and the employee. I think we often talk about it as kind of the organization and the employee, and it used to be employee beholden to the organization. Now employee wants their sense of themselves and the organizations down here. I, I much more like to think about it as a relationship between the two. Um, and each brings a different part to that relationship. And I think one of the things the pandemic gave all of us is forced prioritization. I think that's one of the things that came out of the pandemic, right, is that everybody had to stack rank what mattered. Um, and there was a tremendous amount of suffering, but also a tremendous amount of growth and, and learning that took place during the pandemic. And so I think every generation went through a series of stack ranking what mattered. Um, and I think organizations, as they step into embracing flexibility and space um, and embracing the flexibility that people brought into their work life over the last year and a half. Uh, we have a fascinating frontier, right? In terms of reimagining the workplace. So. And it's also the, the, the mindset change where the pandemic has created, I mean, I believe that the pandemic, you know, this great resignation we're all talking about right now is, you know, a huge part of that was the pandemic of that prioritization you're talking about, right? It's like, hold on. I used to just be a slave to this job. I used to just begrudgingly wake up every day, go to where I hated going because I needed to put food on the table. And now they realize after this, that hold on, I don't have to do that. Right. There are other opportunities and it's just me creating that opportunity for myself and building upon that. Yeah. And so I think there's two sides of the coin, right? One is about the notion of place, the folks that are stepping away from their organization as they're being forced back. And I think that's because we learned that the office was not, when we used to ask, what's the office for? The answer was where we had to go do work. And then we proved we could do work anywhere. Um, and so I think there's a people that are pushing back against that forced return to the workplace, as opposed to embracing hybrid flexibility. The other thing that I think is interesting behind what you laid out around the stack ranking and prioritization is, and I, again, I have this return to the workplace advisory board. And so there's a guy who runs the change practice, a big, big bank. And he said, one of the other things, Tim, that came out of the pandemic is resilience. Unintended resilience. Because think about it, I'm that guy that you were just describing who hates my job. It's November of 2021, I've gone through, I'm sitting there trying to decide what to do. I hate my job. I'd really think about quitting and finding something else, but I just don't know if I got it in me. If I were to ask myself that question two years ago, it's very different than asking myself that question today, right? Do I have it in me to try to step away from my job in November of 19? I'm not sure. Do I have it in me to step away from my job in November of 21? I just survived a pandemic. Oh man, of course, right? Like, I got this, right? I got this. I just made it through 18 months with just my three family members, right? Like, yeah, that. So, forced prioritization comes out of the pandemic, and also some of this unintended resilience, right? Um, also starts to come out of the experience we all went through. So, which means organizations are going to have to be so. You know, I mentioned the unintentional digital transformation, right? The involuntary digital transformation. What organizations are studying in front of is an involuntary cultural transformation if they don't get out in front of it. And so Andy Horlick on my, he's a development team member and instructor here at ProSci, been part of the ProSci family for over a dozen years, but he's really starting to step out into if we, if we as organizations let the cultural transformation that sets in front of us be involuntary, like we let the digital one, um, we're going to be in a world of hurt. And so how do we step out and be intentional around really shaping and nurturing what culture means in a reimagined workplace? So, so 
tell me about that culture. What, what is culture? How, what's that role of culture inside of the idea of change? Yeah. Awesome question. Um, and I can get up on a pretty big soapbox here. Um, we're big Marvel fans at our house. So the soapbox I'll get on up on is culture is never the villain when a change goes poorly and it's never the hero when a change goes well. Culture is not Thanos and it's not Captain Marvel. Uh, culture is, culture is, culture is the backdrop in which you are trying to bring this change to life. And as a change agent, your job is to adapt adapt and understand and accommodate for and adjust for the cultural conditions in which you're bringing that change to life. Now, certainly there are some changes with the expected, expressed intent to change the culture, right? We may have a change where the intention of the change is to help us become more collaborative and less combative. Um, but that's a little bit different. That's where the nature of a particular change is to nudge or influence the culture. Generally, I think uh, most of the time, the culture is what we need to better understand that we're stepping into so that we can help people navigate the change journey we're asking them to take because cultures like the water they're swimming in, right? If we're not accommodating for the water they're swimming in and we're asking them to make this change, swim this way, um, that's an impediment to us supporting them through the change we're asking them to take on, so... Okay. So it's understanding the environment. You, you didn't like what, what comes first, the culture or the change, right? Like, I mean, the culture you... is right. So, uh, we, uh, we, the way we dove into, it's interesting. We tackled culture three, three studies ago, I think. Um, but we tacked it. I kind of got fed up with how culture was being treated in a couple of ways. Um, one of them was this notion of like, here's your three month culture change, like the plan for the three month culture change, mm. right? Better be presented by the tooth, tooth fairy. <laughs> Neither of those, right? This is imaginary, a three month culture change project. My other beef with how culture was being treated was, you know, you'd see these judgmental notions, right? You'd see a graph of a culture and there'd be an inside outside bad good and i'm like no cult culture there's there's too much value laden in that assessment of a good culture bad culture the culture is how people interact and engage with one another it's the behaviors and the norms that they step into and live into because that's what's been created in the space made up between the people in the organization so we took six cultural dimensions we'll see if i i don't know if i'll be, remember, be able to remember all of them but you take something like a uh, performance orientation organization lives across a spectrum around performance orientation. Where you live on the spectrum is the water. How does that impact how change happens? That was the question we unpacked in the research. Uh, you take another one, uh, uncertainty avoidance, tolerance of ambiguity. An organization lives somewhere on a spectrum in terms of its ability to tolerate ambiguity. It either can tolerate none or it gets really uncomfortable if there's not ambiguity, right? And we can envision organizations that live across that spectrum. Change is going to happen in every organization on that spectrum. But if you try to bring about a change where we love ambiguity, how, does, how do you accommodate and adapt for that in your strategy to bring the change to life? Or if you're bringing the change to life in an organization that can handle no ambiguity, how do you adapt and accommodate for that in your communications, in your training, in the way you tap into sponsorship? So that's, I guess, how we, we ended up taking six dimensions and for every dimension said, what are the unique challenges bringing change to life in that kind of an organization? And then what are the specific adaptations you make to, uh, to bring change forward there? So that's kind of how we, we, we decided to take on culture, that it's never Thanos, it's never Captain Marvel. It's not the hero. It's not the villain. It is. And our ability to adapt and accommodate for it, that's the crux. That's where culture and successful change uh, intersect. Okay. <clears throat> I like that. I like that analysis. I think that uh, it's, it's, it's a little deeper than, than what typ typically people go into, right? When they're talking about culture. Um, and mm -hmm. for, for simplicity's sake, I usually just say it's like atmosphere, like you know, in that greenhouse and it's either more toxic or less toxic or more pure, or less pure, depending on, you know, how you want to 
how you want to label it. Oh, certainly. And like uh, competitiveness as a cultural trait will be an asset in certain organizations and will be detrimental in other organizations. It might be an asset in parts of the organization and detrimental in parts of the organization. So yeah, certainly the notion of the, the, the cultural and in particular, the behaviors that manifest out of that culture, I think are it's, it's powerful. We got to take them into account, account right? Because right. they can certainly squash a change. Oh, right? yeah. 100%. Culture can squash a change instantly. So to say it's not either Thanos or Captain Marvel, it certainly has the ability to squash a change. But it's never the reason the change succeeded or the reason the change failed. So. Okay. All right. Question for you. Um, should Captain Marvel get all the glory for flying in at the very end of the movie and saving everybody? Should she get all the, the credit? Well, yes. Right. That's why we, that's why we brought her back at the end of infinity war. We wouldn't have sent out the signal if we didn't know she was going to be our savior. So, uh, it's topical, right? Uh, people listen to this podcast at any time, I'm sure, but it's right around Halloween here in the United States. So, for Halloween, my son was Captain America from the end of Endgame, had the shield and everything. Uh, I managed to find a Thanos from the end of Endgame costume as well that he didn't even know I got. So, and you uh, obviously didn't have to bulk up any muscle for that. No, posture. I mean, I kind of, it's kind of my posture. So I step yeah. into it. Uh, schedules get uh, shuffled and I end up teaching a full day class on how to build change capability in organizations to what we talked about at the beginning, like how do you bring structure and intent to the journey of growing change muscle to a huge class? You know what? There's probably 22 in it of just change architects. The people that are out there trying to help their organizations get better at change, jumped in the car, ran home, changed, got to the school with three minutes to spare and showed up as Thanos on the playground to pick them up from school. So well done, man. Well done. Indeed. That did. Are you, are you, are you Marvel fans or not? Oh yeah. 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 For sure. So I, I, the fifth, my son's in fifth grade, the kindergartners come out first. And the first four of them, of course, are dressed up like Spider-Man. And they start catcalling me across the playground. Thanos, Thanos, right? And so I turn around and I start to really get into it, you know, getting all big. Uh, and I start to raise up a hand to snap. And all four of them are still kind of shooting webs at me. And I pull a snap and one of the four falls back and disappears. <laughs> And I, I just had to applaud that kid's parents, right? That I was like, is well kudos done. Kudos to you. Well the other done. three, they're just shooting, shooting webs, trying to knock me down. But that yeah. kid, he knew. He knew the pain that Tony Stark felt as he looked into Peter Parker's eyes. So. That's, that's deep, man. That's deep. I could see yeah. you like sitting with that kid, you know, on the side, just going deep. Just he like knew. Talking. Just well, talk. then I turn around and I start trying to talk to my wife and her friends again. And pretty soon the cat calls come again. Thanos, Thanos. And so, yeah, back and forth we played. Then I got really into it and they'd shoot webs and I'd start to like oh, pretend that I was getting, you know, hit and knocked backwards. So, and they're like, the other parents are like, who is that guy? Who was the I, dude in the Thanos yeah, costume? Yeah, a little bit weird, but that's okay because that's what makes it so beautiful. Right. It makes balance, so right? Balance, there balance. So let's talk about this coin thing. Speaking of, um, uh, you know, snaps and and eternity and dust particles. Talk about the the coin. You like to talk about the coin. So tell me about the coin. Yeah, I, I you know I find analogies make things accessible for human beings because as they give us something outside of us to attach to. Like if I'm trying to make sense of an idea inside my brain, it's a lot easier if I have something outside of my body to attach that concept to. So, and you get the double entendre of change and coin, right? So just like any quarter or nickel or dime or penny, change has two sides, the technical side. And that's where we design, develop, and deliver a solution for whatever the issue or opportunity is in front of us. That's the technical side of change. And while I say technical, it doesn't have to be technological, right? A lot of the technical side of change is powered by or enabled by technology, but there's a lot of technical sides of change that aren't necessarily technological in nature. I'll give you, a, you know, ProSci, our leadership team rolled out six new values at the start of 2021. Um, those six new values are the technical side of the change coin, uh, even though there's no technology that sets behind them. The other side of the coin then is the people side of change. How do I help people engage, adopt, and use 
whatever that technical solution is that I'm going to bring forward. Because we know the change landscape is littered by examples of beautifully designed technical solutions, right? All the buttons work. All the buttons work. But nobody actually picked up and started using the thing. And that creates no value to the organization. And in fact, it creates negative value to the organization. Because we put a lot of time, effort, energy trying to make that thing where the buttons work that we could have been doing other things with. And now the fact that nobody will pick it up and use it, even though the buttons work, that's the crux. That's the pain of organizational change. And so the technical sides and people sides, it's the both same side of the coin. It's how do we help the organization improve by undertaking this journey, both by designing, developing, and delivering, and helping our people engage, adopt, and use it. So, Love that. Um, and, it, and it's a simple concept, but it's something that so many people get wrong. And I've seen, and I'm not going to mention this client that I've worked with in the past, spend millions of dollars developing something that then gets put on the shelf. And it was like, so then you got to understand, so what was the motivation behind that thing in the first place? And if the motivation was pure and the idea was right, then where did the adoption go wrong? Yeah. And I assume that's what you analyze and implement. At first. Absolutely. Yeah. That's how we, and, and we were founded by a very curious engineer he was running huge process optimization projects, but he kept running into people, right? Dang, hard, people. The hard side of change, getting people yeah. to actually follow the process, no matter how beautifully designed uh, the process was. And so it was that question. What can you do? Why do some projects succeed and others don't? And it turns out it's how well do we help people embrace, adopt, and use that change. And so, yeah, that's the foundation of what ProSci was, was asking that question across tons of dimensions. Because it turns out, you know, human beings navigate change in a, a fairly predictable way. There's, you know, people are beautifully complex. Things are always going to go different than we thought they might. But it turns out if you answer the questions a person has in the order they typically have them when they get, get exposed to a change, you can help them step through that change journey. And so that becomes this foundation of the discipline of, of change management. Okay. But I think you're right. You know, I, uh, I have an image that I use in some of my slides or on the left-hand side, it's a picture of a coin like you'd see at a museum, like crazy high relief, right? I mean, the thing is just beautiful, the artwork and precision that went into that side of the coin. And on the other side, I have a picture of like a Play-Doh coin. You know, like when your kids would take a lump of Play-Doh and use that play-doh imprint to kind of and unfortunately that's the level of fidelity and the level of relief we usually or can pay to the people side of change we spend all this time getting the technical side highly polished and ready to go and then leave that people side completely up to chance so that's the takes, gap we try to close yeah and it takes intentionality and it takes uh understanding that um you know it takes effort and yeah you know what i would i you know, likewise, while we're comparing presentation slides, I have another slide like that, right? Where it's this beautiful house, right? And it's, it's glorious. I mean, the lighting's beautiful, beautiful pool area. And I, and I, I look at it and I ask the audience to say, this is what we all want, whatever the end result, we want the end result. And yeah. when we go into buying a house or building a house, you know, it's going to be painful. Like you have that expectation. It's going to be over budget. It's going to be scheduled long over, you know, the schedule is going to get blown apart. I'm going to have to get into all the details. I'm probably going to fight with my spouse a ton, right? Like all this stuff goes into that. And yet when it really comes down to our profession, when it comes down to whether it's culture or brand and marketing work or change management, I flip over to this next slide of like this busted up shack. And, and it's just like, and I say, this is what we do. So we want that, but we really implement this. And the, me and the mentality is it's good enough. Like, oh, it's good enough, Scott. Like what we're doing, we, it's good enough to get by. We're just going to go with that for now. And I'm like, really? Like the shack is good enough to keep the, the rain off my head, but is it sustainable? Is it scalable? Is it 
simple? Is it going to last? Is it going to impact? Is it going to create the brand image that you want within your organization? Like that's the problem. And I think that we get so hung up on the thing and that we, and we're so finite in our mindset that we just don't put in the effort. Absolutely. Oh, I like your slide and I'll raise you one more slide that I no, use. No, I don't have any more slides. Those are the only two I use. This is a, just a big finish line flag. And the question is, what's the finish line? What's the finish line of this change? Is it turning the thing on with the buttons working? Is it getting that just enough stack? Or is it improving performance of the organization in a market way? And if we can align on what the finish line is, this is the interesting thing, right? There's a wonderful Peter Senge quote, and it's too long, so I haven't memorized it yet. Um, but it's about the notion of empowerment. Here's the Tim Creasy shortened version. Alignment, or sorry, empowerment without alignment only amplifies the chaos. Empowerment without alignment only amplifies the chaos. And so getting anchored to the same finish line, I think is actually where this whole entire journey starts. Because, you know, we watch project managers and change managers sometimes butt heads in the midst of an, of an organizational change. If they realize they're on the same team, charging at the same finish line, now we actually have the platform, the bedrock for effective collaboration. But if you're going to that flag over there on the horizon and I'm going to that flag on the horizon over there, we're, we're at odds. We're not even, and here's the worst part. You wanna know when that happens and it's the worst? It's when we think we're going to the same flag on the horizon, but we're actually going to different ones. It's one thing if I'm like, let's go that way. And Scott's like, no, let's go that way. It's worse when it's like, oh yeah, Scott and I are going in the same, we're going the same place, but off you go that way and off I go that way. I mean, that's even more devastating than us just disagreeing. So this alignment on what are we actually trying to do here? What is the problem to solve, right? Right out of the Lean Six Sigma space. What's our finish line? What is the flag on the horizon? How would we know? Anchoring to success, I think, is one of those huge uh, opportunities for anybody who's trying to help organizations do anything differently. Mm, I just had visions of like third grade um, partner three-legged races going on. And that, okay. That just, yeah, that painted that whole picture for me really well. Thank you for that. Yeah. This ad car, A-D-K-A-R, what is that? I see it behind you on your shoulder. What, yes. what is that? I never know which side it's going to be on this side. side. Uh, that's ProSize individual change model. Uh, aware, uh, it's an acronym it stands for awareness, desire, knowledge, ability, reinforcement. So it's the five building blocks of successful change, whether it's getting a child to pick up their room, getting your neighbor to pick up their yard, uh, helping that community group you're a part of, or getting your organization to adopt that new cloud-based CRM system. Okay, what's the eight, uh, what are the five again? Yeah, ready? So the first is awareness of the need for change. Not awareness that the change is happening, awareness of the need for change. It means I've internalized the answers to why, why now, what if we don't? Once I've internalized those answers, I would be able to say, I understand why this change is necessary. And that's that success milestone for awareness. I understand why. The next is this desire to participate and support the change. It's when I've made the personal decision to step out of what is today, to step out of the current state and to step into making the change. And it's a personal decision, so we can't make it happen, but we can influence it and nudge it. And that's where personal motivators, organizational motivators, the, the what's in it for me, answering the what's in it for me is how we help somebody get to the point where they would say, I have decided to. So I understand why I've decided to. The next is I know how to, knowledge. The problem, Scott, is knowledge is the one we just default to all the time, right? We need our people to be more customer oriented. What do we do? Send them to customer orientation training, right? Like we need jerk default to knowledge, sending people to training as the way to try to get them to change. So we kind of gloss over the ad campaign of awareness and desire. So knowledge needs context on the back of awareness and desire. I also need to know what to do during and after the change. So how am I going to get there? 
After that is ability. That's the second A. And that's where I've actually demonstrated the skills to do things differently. So I can do things differently now when I get to that A ability. There's physical barriers, mental blocks and barriers. It takes practice and coaching, a safe space to refine ability. Um, but ability is where I've actually made the change happen. And then I've joked that had Jeff invented the ADCA model, just ADKA, ProSci would be a complete failure. Because uh, that R at the end, that's reinforcement. <laughs> if he would have forgot that reinforcement, just like most changes do, ProSci would have been a failure. But he remembered, he put that R at the end. Because it's our natural, physiological, psychological tendency to go back to what we've always done. And so we have to be intentional about providing reinforcement to make sure that that change sticks. So ADKAR is how we describe successful change at the individual level. And then the discipline of change management is how we scale that. I mean, we've supported organizations rolling out changes across 250,000 employees. And they structure the way they engage and support those employees around A, D, K, A, and R. So say that we've got awareness of the need. Yeah. Okay? Uh, people are like, yeah, I can see that. I can see where we need to. That's not awareness. That's not uh, awareness? Awareness is, I understand why we're making this change. Okay. So say they understand why they're making the change. Okay. Okay. Straight up. I understand we're making this change. I'll say it more with more conviction. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. And then... And then there's some knowledge behind it of how to do it, but there is a lack of desire to participate yeah. by some people in the organization. Some people will say some people, meaning executives are like, we're doing this. This has to happen. We're responsible to stakeholders. We've got some responsibility here, but then you have people, some managers, they're just like, eh, I know, I know we need this, but I'm not on this page right now. Like I've got yeah. other fires to put out. I'm just not going to do it. But can you still bring about change within that organization without every single person on board with that desire to participate? So you can bring about the project at a project level, but individuals will need to move through ADK and R. So they might get to the desire step. They might get through desire just to be through it and be done with it. They might get through desire because we know they were stuck and their manager came and had a one-on-one -on -one with them and said, you know what, I know you're stuck with this and struggling with it, but I need you to step through this one and get on board. Um, they might start to build a desire when they start to see a pilot project and see some of the examples and wins and benefits that are coming about the project. And they can start to see what it means to them and their own personal motivator. So I'd maintain a person has to get through desire in order to make the change successfully. Organizations can bring about systemic shifts and nudges and movements without every single person locked in. However, like the kinds of changes we implement in our organizations today are going more end to end, right? The more you go end to end with an ERP, the, the more you start to tie together the parts of the organization, you've actually heightened the need for each person to follow the story along. So we have a, had a story in our old ad car book. Maybe it was the old people side book. Uh, somebody who was at our training program, I got to have dinner with him. They'd put in a new shipping system. He runs the uh, warehouse. One of his guys picks up a box, scans it with a gun, and the gun says, we're sorry, that box is not available to ship to the customer. It wasn't entered correctly earlier in the chain. Like you have a customer with an order, a box to be shipped, somebody ready to ship it but there was poor adoption and usage of this new solution somewhere earlier in the chain. And it inhibited our ability to create this, this, the value out of the change. So Scott, we'll actually sit down with any project and say, what percentage of this project's outcomes depend on adoption and usage? What percentage of this project's outcomes depend on effective adoption and usage? Because that then tells us how important the people side of change is to, to, to this equation. So. That's impactful. That's a big question to understand for sure. So tell me about the, uh, here, we're, we're going to wrap this up, but I want to give you the opportunity to talk about the certification, the ProSci certification, unpack that for me. What is that? Yeah. So ProSci kind of the cornerstone offering is this three-day certification program. We don't let you in the door unless you have a project you're working on. 
And you can do it as a postmortem if you happen to be between gigs. But for the most part, everybody in the program is working on a real project that they've brought through the door. So as you learn the ProSci methodology of defining success, defining impact, defining approach, you're actually doing it in real time on the project that you brought. You build an ad car blueprint for your project. You start into your communication plan and maybe even a sponsor plan. You start to identify the sustainment metrics you're going to measure at the project, the individual, and the change management levels. So it's really about applying as you learn it and bringing a level of structure and intent to the adoption side of the equation, the adoption, you know, the people side of that coin. So it's a real immersive program. It's all virtual now. The wild thing, Scott, is that uh, on March 1st, 2020, we had never taught a virtual training program. And I run the development portfolio. So at that point, it was over my dead body. Will we ever take because it was a three-day program and we leveraged the environment so intensely. We did treasure hunts. We were whiteboarding all the time. There was karaoke and chili cook-offs. We leveraged the environment to help facilitate this mindset shift about how important the people side of change was. Because back in 03, 04, 05, it was critical to help people get there. Um, of course, in response to the pandemic, it's all been virtualized now, but it's a really engaging, fun example of a, a captivating virtual experience uh, over a course of three days. So prosci.com is where people can go to. Uh, we have hosts of free articles, blogs, webinar replays, um, but you can also go there to learn about that training program too. I feel like my guru-ness about change management has now been lifted to be almost be equal to yours now that I've spoken to you and uh, been, you know, educated. So thank you. Uh, there's some awesome wise words thrown across here that I've written down that I'll share with my audience after this, but, uh, so cool. Awesome. Having you, man, this was a referral from another person in the change management space who referred you and I'm grateful for them to, for sending you over. So if people want to get in touch with you personally, whether it's to speak or to come in and talk about this topic with their organization, how do they do that? Yeah, prosaw.com is how you would, uh, you know, come into the front door. I'm also most personally active on LinkedIn, so you can track me down on LinkedIn. That's where some of the bourbon-inspired stuff happens, which can even be more fun than the uh, middle-of-the-day recordings. But uh, thank you for having me. You know, I, I've started to describe my own personal aha, or my, my what I'm all about is to help people see the challenges of change as unlockable. Because I think most of the time people have the answers. They know how to over, they can overcome that challenge of change once they see that challenge as conquerable, as something they can unlock. So I was really excited about the opportunity to come share, yeah, a little bit of uh, the way we try to see the world to make it more unlockable for people trying to make sense of change. And I'm going to give you $5 for every time you say the word unlocked. So you are the man. Thank you. I appreciate that. Thank you, sir. Adkar, it's not a city in the Middle East. No, it is an acronym and it stands for awareness. So awareness of the need for change, desire, right? To be part of that, to participate in that change. Um, knowledge, so the K is knowledge to actually do it. A is the ability to demonstrate those skills and R, the key to it all is reinforcement making sure that it's implemented, making sure that there is a sustainable system and place to scale this thing. Because if it's not scalable, if it's not sustainable, it's not gonna stick. And if you don't have the desire, which is what I kind of brought up in the interview, if there is a lack of desire, you're also gonna have a hard time implementing change within your organization. Uh, there's a few other things um, I loved that empowerment, ownership, and accountability aspect of what we deal with now in our culture versus the predictability, the um, authority, and the control that we used to deal with um, in, in kind of the, I guess, the industrial age and the way of thinking back then, the way of work. And, and that's really interesting when we think about how does change fit into those two spectrums and how does it play a role in what we do now? It's all about the people and the people are what are going to make or break 
our ability to change successfully within our organizations and within our culture and humanity as a whole. So I'm really grateful for Tim, wicked smart guy. Thank you, Tim, for being here and good luck at ProSci and all the things y'all are doing over there. Uh, if y'all wanna find out more about me, go to scottwaldron.com. You can find out more of these interviews. You can find some tools, some free tools I have on there for you. You can also go to my YouTube channel, like, subscribe, comment there. Um, I have a ton of free tools to help you in your leadership and cultural and team building journey. Really short, simple tidbits of help there that you can gather. Uh, LinkedIn, connect with me there. And I will talk to you pretty much all day because I like to talk on LinkedIn. So let's do it. Thanks everybody for being here on another episode of Unlocked.